So Kororo Cafe, the, the kaupapa here is around one, pretending you're in a cafe, but we're going through this wonderful, marvelous book here called Kaipara Huarahi. Now, what is this? Um, it looks like from the poll, 50% of you have read the article that we sent out, which is an extract from this. Um, this is not just one article, there are many articles in this lovely little book here. And look, it's got pictures. <laughs> it's important to people like me. Um, the, if, you, if you don't have your hands on a copy of this, you can purchase one from Aratauhi. We can't send it out yet, but once we head to level three, I believe we, we might be able to do a, a run to the, um, to the office to pick some up so that we can send them out to you. Um, but to let you know that Kaipara Huarahi is a youth work journal. So it's written by a bunch of quality youth workers um, who, are, who are keen to help level up the sector, um, offering their learnings for us to read and, and, yeah, and be a part of. So today is a little bit like a virtual book club. Yeah. Um, so some of you have read the article, some of you haven't. Don't worry, it's okay if you haven't. Um, we're, you'll still be able to get lots out of this, but if you have, this will be kind of building on the things that you've, that you've seen in, in the article that you've read about. So um, it's very exciting. Um, also to let you know that this edition of Kaipara Huarahi is focused on mana taiohi. Now, what is mana taiohi? Mana taiohi is the new youth development framework, um, the new youth development strategy. It's, uh, it's incredible, it was a long time in the making, it was only released last year, so we're all still learning what that means together. Um, there's a wealth of incredible knowledge um, which came from He Arotaki Tuhinga, which is a literature review, New Zealand based, um, and then what we read about in the Kaipara Huarahi, which is all about it, and then a bunch of trainings, and we're learning from different people who specialise in different areas in the sector, so it's all very exciting. Um, so that's a little bit of context for, for today. Um, some housekeeping before we kick off into the, the nuts and bolts um, of today. A little bit of housekeeping. We really recommend using Gallery View today um, if you're not already. There's also a chat function which you can find down the bottom where it says chat. That is the chat function. Uh, so feel free to use this. Some of you are already. Give us a hi or a cheers or tell us a joke about like something you spot in the background or or whatever um, and also separate from the chat we have a Q&A function so you'll see it says Q&A Q&A stands for question and answer mm -hmm. um, I didn't learn until far too late in life that FAQ stood for frequently asked questions <laughs> so maybe that maybe Q&A what did and you answer. think it stood for I had no idea I, something about like questions I thought it was like facts like that was a I don't know, anyway. <laughs> we could all um, brainstorm alternative um, acronyms, acronyms for FAQ. <laughs> there we go. That would be great use of chats. Alternatives for what FAQ could stand for. <laughs> um, so please send through your questions. So some of you, as you were reading Kaipara Huarahi, you may have you may have jotted down some questions as you as you went. That would be very cool. Um, and so you feel free to send those through now. If you haven't, um, as Rod and Hannah are talking, um, you, you're welcome to put them through and we'll, and, yeah, and we'll do that. Also, um, you can put up your hand in this Zoom webinar. It says, you know, put your hand up. Um, if you want, if you'd prefer to ask your question verbally, we'll have a go at that. That'll be exciting. Um, so you don't necessarily need to type it, you can verbally ask a question and, and we'll see how that goes. We haven't used that function yet and I'm a bit new to Zoom webinars. Simon, ju Simon just raised his hand but I don't know if we should let him talk. Mm, yeah. Jokes, jokes, love you Simon. <laughs> Shan, um, Shannon's going to manage all of that, so awesome. yeah. Cool. Um, that's all. So um, to, to let you know, the article that we sent out was written by three people. Um, one was the lovely Rod Baxter, who we have here on screen. Another was the lovely Hannah Dunlop, who we have here on screen. And the third author is Sarah Finlay Robertson, who unfortunately um, is unable to make it today, but is as much a part of this conversation um, as these two who are here. And if we have enough um, requests, we might be able to um, we, we might be able to have a part two to this. So we'll we'll see how we we'll see how we go and what we can get through today and what people are um, are keen to know and hear about youth participation or Fawahitanga. So um, Hannah is uh, I've known Hannah for I don't even know how many years. 
Um, Hannah's from, from Christchurch, which is also where I'm from. Woohoo! Um, <laughs> some Safar representation here. Yep. Um, so very cool to have you here, Hannah. And um, and Rod, I've known for quite a few years as well, but have worked very closely with him in the last year. So have got to know him quite well. So it's exciting to have you two here. And I can say that these two, for certain, are absolute experts in the field that they're talking about today. So um, excited for me to shut up and to hear a little bit about them. I'll let them briefly introduce themselves quickly. So let's go to you first, Hannah. Oh, kia ora koutou. Um, I'm not going to do my full mihi because I'm in the process of reflecting on my mihi at the moment and what that looks like. So I'm just going to be real honest about that. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm just in a process of discovery. So I'm going to do mine in, in English. Um, but yeah, kia ora koutou team. Um, I am Hannah Dunlop. I am from Christchurch. I'm originally from Onihanga in Auckland. I grew up under um, Mongakiki. Um, and yeah, I um, live by the beach in a dreamy little cottage, as you can see behind me, um, with my husband, my cat Blue, and um, a wee baby growing that's going to be here in the middle of June. So that's really fun. Um, but yeah, I've worked in local government and um, NGOs and research and evaluation stuff for the last um, oh, 15 years, and youth work for the last 15 years, um, and have stepped out of full-time employment to do my own thing for a bit and support the sector in whatever way I can. So um, before I enter motherhood and then see what life holds. So it's just always a privilege to hang out with, um, with my Arataohi um, fam and yeah, just um, all this poles popping up my thing. Um, yeah, so that's just a little bit about me, but I love nerding out on this stuff with, with great people. Awesome, thank you very much, Hannah. Appreciate that. And I'm very keen to hear about that journey around your, um, your pikiha as well. Let's save that chat for another day. Over yeah. you, Ron. Thank you, Zara, and um, thanks, Hannah. Um, Hannah's inspired me actually to um, have a crack for the third time ever, my heart is beating slightly, um, at reciting a pepeha that I've been um, evolving that I don't entirely know off by heart and am still appreciating um, some of the kupu and whakaruan, but here I go. <clears throat> ko koukou te maunga te ru nei taku ngākau, ko korumako te awa e haumanu tuku wairua, ahako no whenua ke oku tipuna e mihi ana ki ngā tohu o nehi uh, o te whanganui atara e noho nei au. Uh, ko um, Ngāti Pākehā me te tangata tiriti uh, ngā iwi, ko te whari manaki o ngaio uh, te hau kainga ko Rod Baxter tuku ingoa. Um, so, yeah, my name's Rod and I live in Wellington and Ngaio. You can see the sun shining through slightly on my shoulder. Um, the place I live um, was blessed by James Michael Whare Mahihi, who's a friend and uh, um, a matua with Arataiohi and uh, a bunch of friends and family when I moved in here five years ago. And um, the name that emerged in the blessing was Te Whare Manaki. Um, and there's some other... Um, Akara associated with that, but it just um, helped me um, kind of reconcile uh, being Pākehā and um, I don't like the, uh, the concept of owning land, so uh, kind of a kaitiakitanga relationship in terms of, um, yeah, land, whenua um, and our kind of evolving uh, relational culture feels really important to me, so I think that um, and it's kind of, I'm waffling on about this because it seems relevant today mm -hmm. and um, in this time for youth development within the mana taiohi kaupapa as we are aspiring and being um, more bilingual in the um, approaches, the unique approaches we have in Aotearoa. So for me, that um, starts with um, who I am and where I am. Yeah, it's probably enough about me. Awesome, beautiful, thank you Rod. And um, I actually am going to skip up our agenda just a smidge off the back of that because of um, what you've both shared around that, um, around that journey is, is completely off topic, but I have a way to make it on topic, which is Jane has asked, Rod, can you share about the name Kaiparahuarahi? Sure thing. So um, the 
issue that we're looking at is the second issue, which came out last year. Um, and the first issue came out in 2017 to celebrate 20 years of um, youth work ethics since the Canterbury Youth Workers Collective kicked off the um, a code down there in 1997. And we honored um, Jane and uh, Jane Zindel and John Harrington who were pivotal in that process. Um, so originally this was actually just gonna be a one-off publication to celebrate 20 years. Um, and Anya who um, co-curated and edited it somehow had this wild idea, as Anya is prone to do occasionally, to um, why don't we make this a journal, the journal we've always wanted. And the name Kaipara Huarahi um, was actually gifted to Arataiohi, um, and Sarah Finlay Robinson was part of this. Sarah and I, um, when Sarah was chairing um, Arataiohi as part of the inaugural board, um, so this must have been around 2010, 2011, maybe 2011, the, the first wānanga for Arataiohi was held at Taputaranga Marae here in Island Bay. And um, that marae is a really significant site for the development of youth work and youth development in Aotearoa because lots of significant hui have happened there. And Sarah and I had a um, catch up before the wānanga with uh, Matua Bruce Stewart, who um, built the marae um, from the 1970s onwards. It's a living marae. Um, and so Bruce, um, as he heard about the evolution of Arataiohi and the emergence of a new united peak body for youth development, um, he was quite excited and he described um, Arataiohi, the members, the leaders, um, the creators within as um, kaiparahuarahi and a simple translation of that could be trailblazers but a more beautiful translation is kaiparahuarahi create a path where there was no path before. And um, that seemed like an accurate word to describe the legacy that John and Jane have left us um, and continue to shape in terms of youth work ethics. But it also, also refers to all the other voices that um, we captured in the journal, that it's a collection of reflections. It's not just an academic exercise um, for theorists or universities um, or students. It's for everybody who um, thinks about and works with uh, rangatahi, with Tairohi, with young people. And so we're all trailblazers. We're all um, carving new territory. We're finding a path where there was not, path, was not a path before. It might be helpful also to think about ara taiohi. Um, ara, one of the translations, of course, is path. And you can see the word um, ara within kai para huarahi um, at the end there. And kai and arahi together um, as a role or job could mean guide. So. Um, I think it's useful to dissect words, and it is a long word that sometimes people um, can get tongue twisted with, but I think it's a really important word um, when we think about the evolution of our practice. Wow, cool, very cool. I didn't even know half of that. Um, and yeah, wow, I'm a little bit taken aback. That's quite exciting. And again, I, my job here is to keep us on task. And so that also means keep myself on task, which is a real shame because that's cool. And I, and I love dissecting words and we'll hear it. We'll actually hear a little bit more about dissecting words um, shortly. Yes. Cool. Um, 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 uh, sorry to interrupt you. I think just in case people are interested in following that up, it is yeah. mentioned in the first issue in the editorial, um, much of Bruce, et cetera. So there's a place people can go back to if you want to later. Cool, great. Um, and that first edition did not used to be available online, but to let you know that since the printing of the second edition, um, it is now available online. So you can even read that online and maybe someone will pop that up in the chat for you too. Cool. Um, so let's kick off with this Q&A um, session. So this is a little bit like um, an online book club. It's a bit of a, a virtual book club where um, some people have read the have read the article, some people haven't, and now we get to interview the authors. So that's pretty exciting. Um, so the first of all, thank you for writing an incredible article. Um, it is very long, um, but it is incredibly good. It's great, and it's got pictures, and it's got models, and it's and it's quite an amazing experience as you go through it. So if you haven't read it, um, I do definitely encourage you to do so. Um, it's all about fai wahi tanga or um, or youth participation, and I really like youth participation mostly because I feel like I'm a product of great youth participation. Um, I'm pretty sure I peaked as a 17 year old, um, and that was because I had these epic youth workers who really set me up for for a lot of wins. So. Um, so that, that's quite cool. Also, um, I used to work in a youth residential home where um, tenant with young people who struggled with, with mental illness and um, they always got given the worst house. 
So like of the houses for the service, which was a bunch of different people, um, the youth residential house was, it was like falling apart and the kitchen was crap and it was impossible to clean and it was always just a bit mucky. Um, and one day somebody said, because they were building a, a whole new house and they said, what if we gave this house to the young people? Um, maybe they would really rise to the challenge and they would really look after it. Um, and then they never got the good house. <laughs> Because they're like, no, young people can't walk, um, look after anything. I actually think perhaps years after I left, maybe they did have a go in, the, in their house or whatever. But um, but anyway, I love the idea of young people rising to the challenge. Um, and, you know, when we empower them to do something, often they will do an incredible job of it. Um, so that's, yeah, that kind of is, that's, that's my two cents. And now I'm going to be quiet. So, um Rod, um, Rod and Hannah, um, you can choose who gets to go first for this one. But hit me with your elevator pitch. What's, um, what is youth participation? In like, in a succinct little sentence, what's youth participation? <laughs> um, basically, youth participation to me is the realisation of, of the rights of young people. Um, and really it's, yeah, the right of young people to have, uh, have a say in the decisions that affect their lives. And that makes complete sense. To, to me, it's just as simple as young people having the right to be part of the decisions that affect their own lives. Cool, awesome. And I'd what totally back that? that up. I mean, I think, uh, firstly, if I was in an elevator and needed to do an elevator pitch, I would hope that the building that we were in was very tall and that I had many minutes <laughs> <laughs> to, um, to give this pitch. Um, but I've, I've jotted down a couple of thoughts, maybe three or four, that um, maybe are catchphrases that we could use. So. I think first of all, youth participation is about voice and choice. It's about young people having a say and about making some decisions about things that affect them. Um, it's much more than just being present. It's actually um, a very unhelpful and quite confusing term, youth participation, because to participate normally um, means to take part in or to be part of. But um, I think the type of participation that we're talking about is about having a part to play. Um, I'd also um, add that it's a core defining feature of youth work practice. It distinguishes the work we do with young people from other people who also work with young people. Um, and there's evidence that youth participation has been happening since before colonization in Aotearoa. So there were um, and are indigenous practices which involve um, young people in um, the transmission of knowledge and customs and tikanga um, to for the well-being of um, whānau hapu and iwi, so a kind of contextual, historical um, and cultural basis. Uh, and also it's global, so in um, most of the formalised youth work um, movements across the world, um, youth participation has been a defining feature. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, I think it's crucial that we hold on to um, the practice and think about how we're doing it well. Nice, and just like that, we've reached the 152nd floor. <laughs> awesome, cool, thank you very much. Um, now, some of you will have noticed the kind of the interchanging language that we've got here um, between youth participation and whaiwahitanga, and the reason for that is because in the, um, in the youth development strategy, the one that we've just replaced, it was called youth participation. Um, however, now with mana taiohi, this new framework with these new principles, whaiwahitanga is the principle which best aligns with youth participation. So my next question for the two of you, both Hannah and Rod, is tell me about whaiwahitanga, the definition, and part of that will be the breaking down of, of the word, which is awesome. Um, and how is, how is that different from youth participation, or what does whaiwahitanga add? I wonder, Hannah, should I um, yep. perhaps break down the words since I seem to be the, <laughs> the words guy today and then um, chuck it over to you to give it some of the joining the dots between whaiwahitanga and youth participation and the kind of evolution. Would that be a good idea? Yeah, I feel like you've got more in terms of that. You've got more experience in terms of the whakapapa and the conversations around that. Um, you've been more involved in that. Um, okay, well... But, yeah, so I might just ch I might just leave that with you because you've got a bit more experience being he more heavily involved in that. I feel it's pretty equal, but um, <laughs> let's see what comes out. 
Um, this isn't a humility contest. We want both of your expertise. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, well, we know everything then. Um, right. So, uh, has this slide popped up? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, this is in the article, which some of you will have noticed. Um, and it's helpful. Um, and here is a reason why I think it's most helpful. Last night, I had a conversation with a um, guy who's really involved in youth participation across the European Union. He's based in Manchester. And um, I shared the article with him and we were sharing resources with each other about youth participation. And I realized something as I was talking to him, that actually this concept, this whakaro around whaiwahitanga actually has the potential to transform participatory practice right across the world. And uh, we can, we are typically quite humble in Aotearoa. I think that's part of our cultural identity. Um, but here is an opportunity for us to elevate the wisdom that sits within Mātauranga Māori in a way that um, the kupu that are used are not a direct translation of youth and participation. Mm -hmm. They're a bit more sophisticated and they flip the script on how we typically have um, implemented or explored youth participation across the world. So I'll come back to why I think that's the case. But um, the kupu, so Fai, uh, and this is my Pākehā understanding, so... Um, if uh, there are others who are fluent in um, te reo and uh, have whakapapa connected to this kupu, then please um, correct us and throw some stuff into the chat. But what we've heard and what I've learned about the word fai is that it's a noun and a verb. It means um, to pursue, to chase, to search for, aim at, and to be equipped with, possess, and acquire. So um, that's quite an active uh, word. And there's a bunch of things in there that uh, resonate with the definitions of youth participation that um, Anna and I just shared. And then wahi uh, could mean um, to describe a place or an opening, um, a share or an allocation. And as a verb, it means to break through. Um, and so I think we use lots of English words to translate uh, kupu and vice versa to um, broaden our appreciation because youth participation is way too reductive and not as beautiful or helpful as this kupu. Uh, if we put fai and wahi together, um, some advisors from the Māori Language Commission uh, said technically fai wahi means to participate or to have a part, um, which is a bit more sophisticated than just being there or taking part. And fai wahi tanga could be described then by fusing together this um, etymology as to chase a place. And why uh, I think this is significant. This is what I realized with this um, dude from Manchester, is that youth participation has typically been about organizations giving young people a say or giving young people voice, um, giving young people decisions, consulting with young people. But actually the organizations or youth workers are still holding the power um, because we're giving something to young people rather than recognizing what young people already possess in terms of their um, existing agency and capacity um, for empowerment. It's not that we empower young people, but we recognize that they are empowered. And to chase a place is, um, is an empowered thing to do that young people are doing anyway. And so I think youth participation now under a whai wahitanga um, kaupapa acknowledges that young people are finding their place. And um, they're doing that with some sort of degree of healthy urgency and excitement um, to be equipped to um, find out who they are and how they can contribute to our community. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I think to chase a place means. And it flips the script on organizations or adults giving power to young people. It's about recognizing that young people already have that power. Hannah, what would you um, contribute to that? And, yeah. And the broader definition from Manataiohi, which is in the chapter, but what else would you say? Yeah, so I think, um, I think the real nail on the head, and this is something that I often talk to people when they're, when they ask, you know, when organisations or people say, hey, how do we even start this process of involving young people instead of just chucking some young people in a room and going, what do you think? Um, and, and it kind of comes back to that power sharing, but also what empowerment means. And so it's really interesting being part of, um, so I'm in some governance positions with the YMCA, um, nas like locally, nationally, and um, internationally. And globally, the World YMCA, their whole thing is all about youth empowerment and that we empower young people. And there's been this narrative for quite a long time about we empower young people. Well, no, we don't. And there's, I, I 
and I think this is where I have to admit hugely to Sarah because Sarah is amazing at, um, at, at articulating things in a really beautiful way. Like she's just got this amazing way with words and you'll see in the article about the whakapapa of youth participation and how that works. But you really have to mihi to her in the way that she's able to conceptualize things um, and find yeah, really good thinking on this stuff. So um, I really, yeah. And, and so often the rhetoric is around how, um, I'll just actually read a quick sentence from the article because she's just wrote it really well, but and under the kind of title redefining empowerment, but empowerment is not an action of the youth worker to give to young, give young people power, but an outcome of actions and processes that enable young people to discover their own power. Whoa. Mic, mic drop. Um, and again, it's like what you said about flipping the script and how Fai Wahitanga is about, for me, when I, listen to your kōrero and I read about it and I kind of like the stuff I have in my heart is to go well actually this is about us creating spaces and so if we're talking about young people chasing a place or supporting young people to chase their place um, it's well how do we create those spaces in which young people can thrive and step up and actually if we're looking at the why some of the wider movements at the moment well young people are carving their own space they often don't need us but in some senses they do need us but how we how we are in that space to kind of uffy and kind of just get in behind them and go, um, how do we make that work is, um, yeah, is, is, is how do we support young people to chase that, that place? Um, and I think that's kind of, this is, that's how we need to evolve our thinking. And now I guess that's with the kupu that that's the way that it, um, yeah, it reframes that for us and that we are not, we don't, you know, like that we need to step back from like relinquishing power and that the power is in how we create the space for young people. Um, and I think that needs to be the focus. And I think that's what a lot of the article is really about. Here's some ideas and tips and tricks and understanding the whakapapa of youth participation. And that's what we call it, by the way, that, you know, the lineage of youth participation, which Sarah has so beautifully written. Um, but yeah, that's really, yeah, just the thing about like how we do, you know, what empowerment means and how we talk yeah. about it in a very Western way of doing things, like in a very kind of, you know, that's, that's our colonial hangover um, of this whole sense that we're here to empower people that are lesser than ourselves, mm. whatever that looks like. And it's not actually about that. We all have our own inherent power. Young people have their own mana. And that's where I guess it links to that wider mana taiohi. Um, framework is that acknowledging young people's inherent mana and how we and I guess again going back to what Rod said in terms of youth that's where youth work practice is really is is special and that it kind of put it's about unlocking that for a young person oh I um I noticed as I was reading the the article that you refer quite a lot to mana and to Modi um, and to let uh, attendees know that um, we are going to be interviewing Matakino in a couple of weeks to talk about mana and Modi. so if, um, if you're interested in that then um, that's a little plug for in two weeks time we'll be hearing from him so that's the first session at the start of May because um, as you say the whole of mana tile here is so intertwined this is me intertwining it <laughs> Um, it's so intertwined, it's very hard to talk about one principle without another one, hey? Mm. Um, all right, I, um, so in, your, in the article you do give some examples of very good youth participation, um, and I'm conscious of, of time here too, so let's very quickly, um, can you both give us just one example of what you think is excellent youth participation? I, my example is related to Christchurch, and so I wonder if I... Um, start with some brief reflections and then chuck back to you, Hannah, if that's all right. Yeah, um, go for it. And um, I think the other thing we actually haven't acknowledged, uh, which would be helpful, is that the article that we've written is um, in some ways a recording of a workshop that we facilitated originally at Involve 2018 and um, have kind of played with some, in some other contexts. And the reason why the article is so long is because um, partly there's three of us <laughs> all having a say, but also um, 
Sarah's uh, mostly been responsible for the chronology and whakapapa of youth participation practice in Aotearoa. And if we think at least about the last 20 years, um, and this is the context for the examples we're about to share, okay? I think that um, around the late 90s and the early 2000s, particularly when um, we were a decade into having a ministry dedicated to young people, um, and there was a lot of excitement about um, youth development and lots of newness. Youth participation was really important. That's the reason why the Involve Conference is called Involve, because it was actually about involving young people. Um, and the YDSA part of that was about a government ministry working with our serving people 12 to 24. Age 18 is exactly halfway between 12 and 24, which means that half of the youth population can vote and the other half can't. Half are excluded from democracy. And so how do under 18 year olds have a say when they're socially excluded? These were some of the driving forces behind the YDSA that we've forgotten. And that's why youth participation was so important, I think. Um, the original principle was youth development is triggered when young people fully participate. Um, but what we've noticed and what we um, have ranted about regularly over coffee, real coffee <laughs> and Zoom actually, um, is that youth participation became less popular for a while in our practice. And um, I think it's useful to, uh, to become aware of um, the evolution of participatory practice because that informs the opportunities that young people have had. Um, I wanna, I see there's a question from Chloe about go-to models and frameworks and maybe we come to that separately. Um, I'll go straight to my example, which is um, after the uh, 2010 and 2011 earthquakes in Canterbury, um, as part of uh, the recovery process and um, the rebuild of the city, there were a whole bunch of um, incredibly powerful and meaningful opportunities for young people to have a direct say about a city that they were still growing up in and uh, recognizing that the rebuild um, and redevelopment of Christchurch City, as well as um, Canterbury as a region, uh, was going to happen over many years. And so that young people aren't young for very long and would quickly be adults needing to live and exist in that city. And I am just so impressed with the multitude of examples um, that emerged out of Canterbury at the time that actually probably was the um, one of the few places in the country that was doing youth participation well. I think about um, the Bounce Project that um, Hannah was leading at New Zealand Red Cross as part of the Canterbury Recovery Team. I think about the Christchurch Youth Council, and I think about um, Pilot, uh, the Pacific um, Youth Leaders, uh, and those, um, the young people that participated in those things almost a decade ago are now adults, and they're still involved, many of them, in youth development, and they're kind of passing on the baton to other young people to have a say now, and to me, that is some of the most exciting youth participation we've seen in the last decade. I, um, I, sorry to interrupt. I thought it would be so funny if Rod talked about Bounce, and then he did very briefly, But because uh, Hannah led the Bounce project. Uh, yeah, well, kia ora for that, Rod. Um, it was, like I have to say, it was a real... Um, it's interesting that we're talking about the Canary earthquakes now because I look at what at our trajectory and this is like in current context and I think this is kind of maybe some take homes for people is um, watching what's happening with COVID and watching what's happening across the country and the response and um, I shared with Rod and Sarah we were having a conversation around youth participation platforms and kind of some of the learnings from coming through the earthquake recovery and working very like working in local government and, and Red Cross during that time and supporting these wider sector collaborations um, and supporting that I guess that um, ecosystem and that network of youth participants excuse me, youth participation groups, that we had this opportunity um, to, we had this opportunity where we had this real mandate and we had an excuse to go, young people, like we've got the city to rebuild. Well, mm. of course we have to have young people involved and there were so many, there were so many opportunities, but also we couldn't afford to, to screw it up. You know, you've got this opportunity and we've got to do it right. Um, didn't mean that it got done right all the time. Um, and we had to be really accountable. And we actually had to have a whole lot of humility in that. Um, and 
damn, it was frustrating and it's really interesting. Um, I can post a link to a talk that, um, to kind of a panel that was done. Actually, yeah, I'll post a link or share a link at some point to a panel that I spoke on um, with a few other people at kind of a lessons learned hui a couple of years ago. Um, and I, it was great because I wasn't there in any sort of paid capacity. I was there just as me, so I could say whatever I wanted. And then got one of the young on a, on the panel. I just said last minute, I'm like, I feel like a fraud talking on this panel when actually one of the young people who has experienced this whole journey is in the room. And they actually asked if they could tell a story, which was basically bagging up, <laughs> not bagging up, but just really critical of, of a particular process. And I said, sure, why not? And they went hard and it was great. Um, so I'll share that. I'll share that link at some point. Um, but yeah, further to that context, that workshop actually came out of um, then the article really quickly. Sorry, I know it's not a question um, and time. But um, uh, the article, uh, so the, the workshop came from Rod and Sarah and I kind of doing kind of almost peer supervision about some stuff and having chats on, on, on the phone and over Zoom. And with, with Involve coming up, we we're like, we want to do something together. What should we do together? And um, we had this, I vividly remember, because we had this, started having this conversation and we were talking about power and ethics and all this sort of stuff. And I was taking notes. The others didn't know this, but I was taking notes the whole time. And we were like, okay, so what should we do this workshop on? I was like, well, I kind of think we should, you know, we were like, why don't we just do it on the conversation we had? And me being the nerd that I am, I'm like, well, these are the themes that have been emerging from our, um, our conversation. <laughs> um, why don't we do this? <laughs> and, um, and that's kind of how it all started, really. And, and, and I just want to rewind even further to involve like 10 years before that. Um, and I was in a place in my career where I was like, I don't know where I fit and I don't know where I want to be. And I went to a workshop that Rod ran on power. And I don't really know many people in the wider youth work sector at that point. And I was at a real crossroads. Um, and there was this, this workshop and, um, and it kind of gave me, it, it sort of turned a light bulb on for me. And actually not long after that is when I um, got my first role in local government, literally doing youth participation. So um, I just want to mahi to the power of kind of what, what gathering together and learning together and forming relationships together, what that can yield and why that's so important for us to link so that we can keep each other accountable as well. Because that's the other thing is that we need to keep each other accountable. And I also have to mihi to my Canterbury whanau, um, and particularly some of the young people um, that have come through, like Hamish Kewan, who, um, who's still actually working at the Canterbury Youth Workers Collective, who, and, and some of the Canterbury Youth Workers Collective whanau and that community in Christchurch, going back to sort of post-earthquake stuff, is keeping each other accountable in our practice. And when you're working in a big organisation, like I was working for regional council and holding me accountable when I was kind of getting captured by, and I have to sort of acknowledge that I was being captured by um, the big machine in a sense. Um, so yeah, and that, that ethical kind of stuff as well. So I just want to, I guess that's a bit of an example of actually the wider community of youth participation and the power of organisation and Canterbury Youth Workers Collective. Um, and the coming together of the sector to keep each other accountable and being accountable for practice and actually being able to call out when actually in, in a gracious way when practice maybe isn't so great. Um, it's really hard. It's just yeah. so hard and yeah. requires relationship because uh, we'll be honest, Sarah, Rod and I, when we sometimes have our catch-ups and this is, you know, okay, so we sometimes have rants about some horrific youth participation that we've seen and it just grieves us to our soul but it's like how do we challenge that and mm. how do we um how do we yeah so anyway that's just a bit for my heart yeah. but. but also there's an invitation i think for everybody who's watching and tuning in today um to do this with each other i mean that's the strength of and the agility i think of our youth sector that we can collaborate and do stuff so when we waffle on about workshops and things that we've written actually that there's no um, possessiveness or restriction on anybody having a say within our sector. So I think there's a there's a parallel thing that can happen with youth participation and youth development participation that we should all be getting together, 
attending um, involve throwing workshops and learning from each other because really rich stuff comes out of it that ultimately benefits young people. Mm. Yeah. That, uh, I, uh, that's, that's so perfect to end on to Rod, or to, to end this, this particular part of the discussion on because at the end of the day, it's young people who win and lose and, mm. and that's the role of us as youth workers is to, is to help them win in as many, as many ways as possible. Very cool. Um, hey, we've had a couple of questions come through and one of them is in line with what I'm really keen to ask as well, which is how can you measure when Fai Wahitanga has done, has done well or not? And, um, and my question is like, how do you, how do you know from, from the outside? Like, how do you, so one within an organization, how can you measure if it's done well? But two, like, just how do you know? So well, I'll just, oh, yeah, so I'll just quickly jump in. This was going to be the example I used, which I didn't get to because of time and waffling. But um, so I was for the last four years, um, Environment Canterbury, which is the regional council. And a lot of people don't really know what regional councils do, um, which is fine. But one of the things I've been working on was establishing um, some kind of youth voice or mechanism for youth voice um, and working with young people in, in different groups around what that needs to look like and going on that journey to design um, what that looks like. I'm not going to say co-design because I personally am not a fan of that word. I see there's a question about it, but anyway, don't get me started. Um, <laughs> but, but basically to work out what that needs to look like in response to young people, but be that bridge between young people and, and decision making. So, so that youth report, we took about a year, it took about a year or so. It really took probably about three years of like some two years of groundwork and then a year of consolidated work with a group of young people to establish that and what that could look like and doing a process, getting those young people to actually do a process of consultation with all the different stakeholders and who needed to be involved and all that sort of stuff and just taking our time with it um, because yeah. So anyway, so we did that and then, so they established the, we established the um, Environment Canterbury Youth Thropu and um, really we're allowed to have that be quite iterative, but still with some good boundaries in place. And, um, and just gave permission to try some stuff. And um, so anyway, you know, it was really hard to leave at the end of last year after it had been going since about May and kind of having to trust that we'd laid the foundations really well. Um, and I'm really stoked to say that even after, you know, that summer break, they've come back, they're really strong. And I was talking to one of them the other day, um, you know, that's after not being there for a little while. And, um, and they were saying with so much excitement about a whole bunch of stuff they were involved with, which we laid the foundation for. And, um, and they've just done a banging submission to the annual plan, like so banging. Um, and that's, for me, I guess that's when we know it's worked, is when you can step away and you've done enough groundwork with the organisation to embed what you're doing but you're also seeing the young people celebrating their success and mm. still going. And I guess for me, um, something I learned through youth work and doing grassroots youth work and, um, and, and in a faith-based context is, you know, that kind of Jesus leadership that actually Jesus left and left the disciples to it. So that's my kind of way I look at leadership is that, you know, you've done a, you know, it's worked when you personally can step away and it carries on and it can still work. Um, obviously, there's other factors um, why it might fall over and not just you um, or why it could work and not just you. I'm not saying it's centred on you, but I'm just saying um, that that actually we should be able to have, and actually that comes through Lundy's model as well that, um, that we talk about in the article, is that when you can step away and young people are doing it for themselves, that's an indicator of success when you have to be less involved, I guess is the really short way of me saying that. Cool, I, I love that. I, um, I remember learning when I did a leadership diploma back in the day, um, you know that it's time to pass something on when someone can do something half as well as you. Yep. And, um, and, and that's that I've never heard that parallel with the Jesus model before coming from faith-based background myself is, um, is quite cool. So I like that. Thank you. I'll be adding that to my kite. Um, hey, we've had a few, a um, few questions. So you both, you both just bang on co-design. Um, and so we've had a question on that. I am aware of time though. Um, we try to keep this under an hour just so that, you know, it's kind of like a bit of a morning tea break or whatever. So we've really only got a couple minutes left. Um, so we do have a question about co-design, which is um, what advice or suggestions do you have 
for the, the government about how to do youth co-design, but also what is it about co-design that we, that we don't like? Because um, <laughs> we're enjoying hearing these, these perspectives. Um, so who, perhaps one of you can say, what advice would you give government? Maybe you'd be good for that, Hannah, because it kind of has been um, where you've been for a little while. And then also, and maybe Rod, you can tell us why you don't like that. Why are you vomiting at the word co-design? <laughs> So this is where I wish Sarah was here because she's way more gracious than Rod and I. <laughs> um, she's way more gracious. Um, I think, and, and look, I'll, I'll have to just eat some humble pie a little bit here in that um, I think sometimes in the youth development sector, we can be a little bit elitist and we can... Um, we can go, we know better and what are people from other sectors trying to do youth stuff, trying to do. So like, I will, I'll, I'll own that um, and be honest about that. Um, but I think part of the issue with co-design that I have is that people, um, what it's done in the absence. So with partly with the, um, the local government act changed in 2012 um, to remove the four wellbeings. I won't go into it, but basically what, Partly what that did over a kind of a nine year span was eroded kind of um, particularly that youth participation drive and that incubator for youth participation declined within local government specifically, which was where a lot of the youth participation opportunities were. Um, and, and then in its place started to come a lot of the social innovation, which I think is really awesome um, and looking for innovative ways to, to you know, to have interventions for young people. But what it meant was people from, that don't come from a youth development background um, were coming into the space and particularly design thinking became a really big kind of buzzword for the government. Like everything was kind of design thinking. Um, and co-design was kind of, I guess, part of that, that space, which is awesome. And there's some really great methodology in it. Um, but co-design is more of a, a practice a tool that you use as part of a wider youth participation lens. So just like, you know, a focus group or a um, citizen jury or whatever, it's a tool for as part of a wider youth participation, but can't be done in isolation without this grounding in, in my opinion, positive youth development. And um, yeah, so I just see it as more of a tool for, um, yeah, a tool for that. But I'm not saying that co-design is not great and, and that co-design is perfectly fine and is a really useful term um, for helping explain it. But I just don't think it's the be-all and end-all, if that makes sense. And, and there is a piece in the article on the page. I'd encourage you to read it because Sarah has written it really well um, on page 32 and 33 in, um, in the article. Um, oh. Oh, that, that's awesome. And, um, and I feel like if you, if people have time to kind of pick apart some of these models, which there are, the, the diagrams are in, in this mm. article as well, um, pick apart some of the models and you can kind of see where co-design is, just the language of it kind of implies something slightly different, um, I think is, is cool too. Um, um, and, and I haven't really answered the government question, um, but maybe we can look at that in another session because I think that's a whole can of worms that it's really hard to that's just hard for me to answer right now and I can have a bit of a think about it and maybe we can talk about it in a different session <laughs> but oh, oh, Rod, if you let if you let me screen share I've got a slide with all the models on it from the handout oh, probably, yeah of course I mean I think that this the other the answer to your question Zara about why the aversion is that co-design takes a slice, a piece out of the models, which um, privileges adults. And most co-design processes right. that I've been a part of have been delivered by um, corporates or um, design agencies or something who are making money off work with young people. And they're using, they're selling, essentially, they're contracted by somebody to harvest, they use words like harvest in a co-design methodology, um, harvest young people's opinions, but they don't often go back to young people and say, this is a result of this consultation. And even mm -hmm. if they do, they interpret it without young people. So I think mm -hmm. co-design is an incredibly limited and manipulated um, approach. 
doing um, designing stuff with young people is good. Like I like that bit, but where co-design as a term has gone, I think is really perverted. Um, Chloe asked, which is my favorite model? And it's in the middle there from Annie Wedinger, who's um, in Melbourne. And that's a that's the only, or maybe there's also the Pacifica and Nodio frameworks, um, which are more recent, but probably um, Wedinger's star was maybe the first uh, and for a long time, the only youth participation model that was actually created with young people who report sharing a new story for the Foundation for Young Australians is free to download. Um, and because it's a process and got kind of values and kaupapa at the heart, I think it makes the most sense here. It's not levels or hierarchies like most of the other models. Um, and that's probably my favorite, but I think the best- It's pretty <laughs> ironic, hey Rod, that um, it's, it's pretty ironic that youth participation models are made without youth input. <laughs> that's true for most things that we do with young people. And yeah, but you're right. I mean, I think that we need all or many of them to make um, excellent decisions. And some of the other questions I see in the Q&A, like from Eddie, I think, it, it, like a youth council or advisory board is ostensibly about youth participation, but actually most of these things can be true in all youth work contexts. So yes, mentoring programs should be asking about how do young people have a say and make decisions about um, the mentoring relationship, the program overall, um, what they're gonna do at Saturday's event, um, it requires reflection on our behalf and our teams to think about how do these ideas appear in our, in our mahi. Hey, um, I love where this is going and I, I, I'm definitely feeling a need for part two because I feel like we're just kind of scratching the surface and that's off the back of a, a lot of people having read the article as well. So, um, if you guys are keen to hear part two, um, do let us know in the chat. Um, there we go. There's a yep part two already come through there. Um, right. And it would be awesome to have oh, a t shirt. Shout out to War and Peace up North Zoo. Great. Look at that. Um, hey, I, we, we need to draw today to a close. And so I'm, I'm really. I'm really, um, I'm really pleased with today. I'm really pleased with the turnout. Um, thank you so much for, for, for bo to both of you for, um, for speaking today. So ngā mihi nui kia kōrua. Um, ngā mihi nui kia koe sera too for being with us in, um, in spirit. So thank you so much for the two of you for giving up your, your morning and sharing your morning tea break with us in this um, funny little cafe that we're trying to make happen. Um, is a, is a bit of fun and, and cool to have the kind of the community together here as well. Um, thank you heaps to the attendees who came too. Um, you guys have been great. It's cool to see the, the chat going off um, and cool that you've come along. Um, and I, I really want to just say, um, you know, throughout this, this Rahui, throughout this time of, of, of weirdness that we're all in worldwide, um, it's very cool to be able to have these, these various trainings and things going on. Um, if you, if, if if uh, people who are here today are keen for more trainings um, or different styles of trainings or, or whatever it is that you want, um, there are different youth work organizations who are doing it. So you can check out the Aratauhi website. Um, we've got a navigating the pandemic together, kind of a bit of a COVID-19 response page going on there, which is, um, yeah, which is a good, which is a good time to kind of link you into those places. But thank you very much, team. Um, it's been wonderful having you here, and um, we look forward to doing this again. We're going to keep this up for a minimum of the level three and level four restrictions, um, and then depending on the interests, we'll we might look at keeping this going. So again, let us know in the comments. Um, but for now, I am going to finish with Kiato another karakia. Kiato Kiato tato katoa. Te atapai o tō tātou ariki a ihikaraiti, me te aroha o te atua, me te whiwhi ngā tahitanga ki te wairua tapu. Ake, 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 amine. 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 Kia ora oh. whanau. Kia ora team. Kia ora whanau, we'll see no you next time. No toilet break needed. <laughs> <laughs> you made it, Rod. <laughs> Beautiful. Hey, and anyone with any more questions or want to chat about any of this stuff, just hit, hit us up. Are you guys happy to um, maybe pop your emails or something in the in the chat, or would you like us to kind of filter that? Um, happy for it to go to Aratari. It probably makes sense um, for a central mm. thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, happy to hear from anyone. Yeah. Oh, awesome.